And coming up now, we have Ryan Jackson, who's going to tell us how to make uh, spheroids through single minor merger. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so um, I'm Ryan Jackson, and I'm a first year PhD student from the University of Hertfordshire in the UK. And I'm going to be talking about forming extremely massive spheroids via a single minor merger. So, a bit of background first. Um, massive spheroids dominate the mass density of the local universe. It's therefore pretty important to understand how they form and evolve over time. Major mergers are known to be very efficient at causing morphological transformations, and so it's natural to assume that they cause the formation of these spheroids. More recently, though, the role of other processes, for example, minor mergers, have been highlighted at their effect at being able to cause morphological transformations. Beyond the knee of the luminosity function, extremely massive spheroids typically have high ex situ mass fractions. This is due to a rich merger history comprising of both major and minor mergers. However, in this study, we show a population of extremely massive spheroids that have low ex situ mass fractions. So the question is, how do these galaxies form? To answer this question, we use Horizon AGN. Horizon AGN is a hydrodynamical cosmological simulation employing the Ramses AMR code. It simulates a 100 comic cubed volume with WMAP7 lambda CDM initial conditions. It has a dark matter resolution of 8 times 10 to the 7, a gas mass resolution of 10 to the 7, stellar mass resolution of 2 times 10 to the 6, and a 1 kiloparsec spatial resolution. So where does this sample come from? Well, this very colorful plot over here, uh, if I can try that one. This very colorful plot over here is plotting a selection of galaxies from Horizon AGN, plotting ex situ mass fraction against stellar mass, and color coded via the galaxies V over sigma. So we've selected a very massive, very spheroidal selection of galaxies with stellar masses greater than 10 to the 11 solar masses, and V over sigma less than 0.3. We set a mass ex situ fraction of 0.3, and this is approximately the boundary between major and minor mergers, and so galaxies below this shouldn't have had any major mergers in their history. This conservative sample generated 10 galaxies, which is a frequency of around 5% of these massive spheroids in Horizon AGN. So what does this galaxy sample look like? Well, this is some mock GRI images of the galaxies at redshift zero. It's the final state of these galaxies after the merger has taken place, and you can see that these are all spheroids. These two plots here show before and after. This is the before image, and you can see a disk and the satellite here, and this is the spheroid that's produced after the merger. So what does these mergers look like while they're going on? Well, this is um, in red, we see the existing star particles before the merger occurs. In blue, star particles that have been formed since the merger started. And yellow shows active star formation. We can see that when the merger happens, stars are blown out in all directions before mixing together and settling into this puffed up spheroid at the end. So what's the effect of the minor merger on the galaxy itself? Well, in these three plots, this gray region here shows where the merger takes place. Um, the graph on the left shows the evolution of the V over sigma in the main progenitor. The one in the middle, here we have stellar mass as it changes over time. We have ex situ mass, which is accreted onto the, onto the main progenitor, and the gas mass of the main progenitor itself. And this final plot here shows the um, effective radii as it changes over time in the main progenitor. In all of our galaxies, we see a catastrophic change in V over sigma um, that is permanent after the merge has taken place and it takes place on the order of a few hundred mega years. This is followed by a sustained period of significant star formation, and unlike in um, minor merger triggered disk instabilities, we find that um, these galaxies don't contract. They actually continue to increase in size and in mass. So what properties do these remnants have? So this table just shows um, a couple of uh, properties of the remnant of the spheroid at the end. We can see here the mass of the spheroid divided by the mass of the progenitor that formed it. And we can see that in all cases, these, these spheroids are much larger than their initial progenitors. 
They all have very low V over sigma, as we expect. They have large effective radii, typically larger than that of a typical spheroid at z equals zero. They also have surface brightnesses that's lower than a typical spheroid. And they come from a range of, uh, of local environments, from galaxies in the field to galaxies in clusters. So it's clear that local environment is not what's the cause of these galaxies to be produced. We also think that we need a deep survey like LSST to kind of observe these galaxies um, observationally. So are there any properties of the progenitor and the merger that would give an indication of how they formed? Well, they mostly form at low redshifts, and they all have, apart from one example, um, low mass ratios down to around 1 in 10. Um, what we did was we took, we created a control sample of around 200 galaxies with stellar masses within 0.04 dex of the progenitor at the redshift of the merger. We used this to create um, relative gas fractions, relative clumpiness, and relative effective radii of both the stellar populations and of the gas. We can see that generally these galaxies aren't particularly gas rich and they aren't particularly clumpy. They are on the whole generally um, larger than the control sample. Um, it's the gas fraction. So it's the um, mass of the gas in the galaxy divided by the mass of the stars plus the mass of the gas. Uh, well, so one is kind of one to one uh, compared to the control sample. Yeah, I mean, this is. No, so what this is is basically the, um, the, the relative gas fraction. So it's the gas fraction of a galaxy in our sample divided by the gas fraction of the average of the control sample. So one would be the same as the average of the control sample. Um, so it's the same with the clumpiness. They are larger on average than the control sample um, and similar for the, the gas radius. We then did the um, relative star formation rates of these galaxies when they're undergoing the mergers. And we can see that they have very enhanced star formation when the merger is taking place, which might be a way to detect these observationally. So, if none of those other things are causing these galaxies to be produced, what could it be? So we finally looked at orbital configurations. Um, first, a slight caveat in that Horizon AGN has a time resolution of 100, around 130 mega years. So we took the orbital configurations at the time step just before the merger. Uh, we looked at two parts of the orbital configurations in particular. We looked at the orientation of the spin of the progenitor and of its satellite. And we looked at the um, or orbit of the satellites compared to the plane of the disk. For in this uh, histogram here, the red dotted line shows the control sample, and the histogram is our galaxies. And we can see galaxies on the right would be prograde. Galaxies on the left means the spins are retrograde to each other. And we can see that, like the control sample, there isn't really a preference to one or the other. However, when we look at how the galaxies orbit around, how, sorry, how the satellites orbit around the um, the galaxy, we can see that they definitely prefer to be coplanar to the disk, either prograde or retrograde. Um, this means that if the, the galaxies are orbiting prograde, uh, sorry, if they're orbiting pro, pro, uh, sorry, they're orbiting coplanar to the disk, they're coming in edge on with the disk and able to deliver the angular momentum um, straight into the disk rather than orbiting around it. So this sample is very small, so I've decided to extend the sample out by reducing the selection criteria. Um, I've increased the final V over sigma to 0.4 and reduced the mass slightly, and this is the um, graphs that are produced. Now you can see that it's not as pure. We now have galaxies filling in the central bit here. Um, but still, the, the, the preference is for coplanar mergers. So in conclusion, it's possible to create massive spheroids via a single minor merger. The progenitor systems are generally normal in gas fraction and clumpiness compared to the control samples. It appears to be caused by a specific org, uh, orbital configuration where satellite orbit is close to coplanar with the host disk. Massive spheroids do not require a rich merger history. These galaxies form without much merging at all and definitely without major mergers. Thanks for listening.
Yes, yeah, so it's about, um, if you take the massive spheroids, so anything above 10 to the 11, it's about 5% of those galaxies. Um, that's the strict um, selection criteria. So it, if we, if I'm going to investigate this further, but relaxing the criteria slightly, this is now a sample of 200 galaxies. So it, it, it might be more than 5%, but 5% is what we're saying at the moment, for sure. Uh, we're just taking um, disk galaxies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but that's something I could look at. Just shout. Uh, yes, there is, that exists, yeah. I don't know. I haven't used um, Horizon no AGN. I've only used this one. <laughs> sure. Um, so we're actually looking at um, whether the AGN is particularly active now, before and after the merger. Um, but that's something I'm currently looking at at the moment. So in Horizon, without the AGN, you don't have spheroids in Horizon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Time. 